Okay, this demonstration today is going to be how to use a bench, brake lathe. And of course, we'll be showing you this wrench and that wrench and the bigger wrench for the arbor nut, the bits. And maybe we'll just start off by changing the cutter bits. You buy these little kits, and I'll just go ahead and empty one. I'm going to change one of the bits right now because it is chipped. I'll set that aside. But in that, you get a, a new screw and a, and a new bit. This has already been used. I'll have to just use the one good corner. Anyway, let's go ahead and focus over here on the tool holder. And give you a little idea, a better idea of a tool holder. I'm going to go ahead and take off this one right here. And I guess a principle to share right now is everything about a brake lathe. These have got to be tight. When we get to the point of actually turning, we want these tight because these, these hold this uh, tool holder portion down as well. We want everything tight. Uh, any, any loosenesses will, will cause a vibration, and a vibration translates into a, a, a rougher finish, a, a less desirable type of finish. So anyhow, so here's a tool holder, and you can often replace these. This has been used a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and put this one back in. I'm going to change this bit. I want to introduce the tool holder, and again, every now and then it's a good idea to make sure they're tight, and sometimes you've got to adjust these in or out based on how thick the rotor is. You want to keep some good geometry. We'll get to that. Okay. Let's go ahead and change the one cutter bit. Once again, this here's the most beat up of the two. And if you look kind of closely, um, that's actually got a chip on it that's been used and I think that's got a small chip on the end it's not terrible but I still want to change it and I'm going to go ahead and put on a new bit here at least the one end is brand new it looks like to me and uh, okay so that's tight We'll leave these loose, we'll move that around later. Okay, now, um, I'm gonna go ahead and mount a rotor. We'll talk about measuring in a bit. I mean, the, re the whole reason I can even resurface a rotor using a brake lathe is because the rotor is thick enough to begin with. But my point today is how to use the lathe. I hope you've all already made the decision. Is the rotor even thick enough? So we have to compare that to minimum spe specifications, what have you. Let's go ahead and back up a little. I'm going to grab kind of a rusty rotor. You can see all this? Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and open the cabinet. Go ahead and take a shot of the cabinet for our folks that will be uh, taking classes here. I sure like to keep things a little organized here. There's little silhouettes for everything. Um, I think one of the most important tools is hanging right here. How how we uh, measure the thickness of a, of a disc rotor, brake rotor, and it's got a little point on it. That's to get into a groove. You wanted to get into a groove, but uh, this is actually more of a dedicated type of a digital caliper for measuring brakes. So, on to setting this up to use the lathe. Now, I'm going to go ahead and use this bigger adapter, this ring, for one reason. This ring will fit inside here with a little bit bigger diameter grip. Sorry for the rusty rotor. <laughs> but uh, the bigger diameter I can gra grab or grip onto the face of a, or I should say the hub of a, a disc brake rotor, the less vibration. It's a smaller diameter now, but I'll put this adapter on. Not all rotors are going to accommodate that adapter. Sometimes we have a smaller diameter or a smaller rotor, obviously, and this adapter may not even fit in there. The point is, we'll be down here on a flat, machined surface. We don't want to be mounting up here on the rough cast area. That'll make the rotor wobble or turn in a, 
in a warp type fashion on the lathe, which would make for a poor, a very poor resurface job. Okay, so rotor goes on, in, in essence first. Our next piece would be this cone. And the cone is always pushed in by a spring. So that's the principle. The spring pushes the cone in to keep things centered. Now I'm gonna let it just kind of sag there for a moment. I'm gonna get this nut here. We'll use a spanner inch to tighten it here in a moment. Okay, push that on. Left hand thread, as we cut, a normal right hand thread would tend to loosen this. That's why they put these, or design these machines with left hand thread. I'm just gonna rotate though, the rotor a little bit, make sure the cone has a chance to center things up. Then I'll finish tightening. About a half a turn off. Okay, center things up. I'll tighten it. And I'll get this spanner wrench. I'm gonna stir these out of the way for now. And I'll put my spanner wrench on there and I just give it a good pop. That's about all you gotta do. It's just gotta be firm and solid. As I mentioned earlier, Another way to help, or we, we talk about vibrations and having everything here tight, we can also put on a silencer band. And I'm gonna choose this style. Um, I guess I'll just show both actually. These little lead lugs. Okay, just put it on that way. These little lead, lead lugs help absorb vibration. Again, we're trying to keep a nice smooth finish. Uh, maybe I'll try the, I'll show the other one. It's got some springs. They made it look, look like coil springs. And uh, they've got rubber. Uh, they've got rubber inside. A big old length of rubber there to help keep things smooth. Okay, so here's another style. I'm not sure which one's better. This one here can be more convenient to use to hook up. That's kind of nice too, isn't it? Okay, so now let's back up a little and I'm going to come over here and start running the lead screws. Okay, and there's one over here. My goal is to set up the cutter so that it's good in parallel with the surface of the rotor, these, these cutter arms. Um, quite often I'll come over and someone has got this kind of on an angle and they've got these cutter arms kind of skewed and these, these points aren't in line with each other. Our goal is to try to have these two cutter points pretty close to being in line and straight across from each other. And that these, again, are parallel with the surface of the rotor. So we can, we can crank this back and forth as we need to to get this lined up. Okay. We can manipulate that in that fashion. We can also, with this loose, slide the whole head around. Again, our, our, our goal is to manipulate things to have a good cut, a good parallel setup condition. In fact, I'm going to pull this cutter out. This one here is back in there further as compared to this one. So I'll just take a moment and I'm going to uh, loosen that guy. I can feel the crud out of there. I'm just going to kind of eyeball it and see how get it relatively close to the same. Okay. We're about ready to turn. Start turning and resurfacing. I'm going to go ahead and flip the switch on. Over here, the switch. Okay. The reason for the uh, selection of drum or rotor is for one basic reason, and that is if I switch drum, this will automatically engage this lead screw and have the automatic feed feature. But if it's in drum and I want to automatically engage for this automatic feed for resurfacing a rotor, it's not going to work. So I've got to use, if I'm cutting a rotor, I've got to switch the rotor. So this, when I engage it, will kick in the automatic feed. I'm not ready for that yet. Let's go ahead now, but through the rotor. I'm going to crank 
this end, the cutters are wide enough. They're not going to touch the rotor yet. I'm going to come in about half or maybe 66% of the way in. Okay? And the whole goal now is I'm going to take the cutters in and I'm going to make a, what they call a scratch cut. Just barely nick it. Make a little teeny scratch. You'll hear it. That was plenty. <laughs> if I move the lead screw a little, I'm still touching, aren't I? Let's do the same to the other side. I'm going to turn this guy in, this cutter in, just until it scratches. Now they've both touched. Now don't be afraid, as you crank this in, it might get a little heavier on the cut. Rotors tend to wear on a taper fashion. It's like the further we get away from the hub, out here are the ends, the outer edge, more heat translates into more wear. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and crank this in. I'm going to take this clear in until I hit into a lip or a rust. In fact, I'm going to turn the machine off for a minute. And the reason is, I want to make sure the pad that was riding on here, we've gone into at least where the pad was riding. I want to make sure i got a good wide path for the new brake pads to ride on. Okay, coming back on. I'm not quite in far enough. I gotta watch both sides to make sure. Come on over here. I want to make sure that you gotta kind of be conscious that this bit doesn't hit the hub. In fact, look how this is kind of wobbling. This is a good example. I'm gonna shut down. I'm gonna loosen the nut and maybe center up this hub a little bit better. It's kind of wobbling. I'm going to see if I can't center that up better. And I hope my main enemy isn't rust. This, this rusty hub, the rotor, might be probably my reason. Okay. Let's see if that'll do better. Just got to loosen and maybe find center. Going back on. It didn't really do any different. Might be worse. That's okay. Let's shut her off. Just a good example. I'm gonna find the reason why. Nope, oh, wrong way. We're gonna find out why. And I should back. Whoop! I should have backed this off a long time ago. Clear off. This is something you will encounter. This is actually a good thing to happen. Okay. I should have took a wire brush and knocked this stuff out of the way. Because anything small and out around here translates to, you know, out here on the outer edge to more out of roundness. Okay. That's probably a little bit better. Back on. Make sure the cone is clear. And let's hold that there. on. I might redo my centers. I'm going to back them off just a little. With my scratch cut, I'll just redo that a little bit. I'm going to crank this back in. Make a little scratch. Both sides. Crank it on in until I 
bit wider now. This side is well in to where I need to be, but this other side is not quite there. Almost there. There we go. We're there. I've actually nicked the hub. <laughs> so be cautious of that. You can nick them a little. Now, so now how deep to go? Here's a little numbered collar. Now I'm not turning the cutter yet. I'm not moving the cutter. But this numbered collar, I'm going to go to put it to zero. I'm going to take off, oh, let's take off eight thousandths. Somewhere between five and twelve, six and twelve thousandths is usually a common load or cut, a depth of cut. I'll do the same over here. Okay, I haven't turned the cutter. I'm just going to turn the numbered collar to zero. Here's my little pointer. And again, I'm going to take off, let's see what eight thousandths does. Now that I've got my vibration dampener on, the cutter bits are tight. These little locks for the cutter holders, make sure they're tight. I'm going to engage. Of course, to self-engage, which leaves the best cut. I'll let the lead screw automatically feed. And it's going to start cutting here in just a moment. And here we go. Come on. There we go. What's good is you can hear a consistent cut going clear around. If it was skipping, you're, you're not deep enough. And all you gotta do is stop, take the cutter back in, go a little deeper on one side, the skipping, and then re-engage, let it self-feed out. Hear that squealing noise? That's actually a vibration. I'm going to try something. This device here helps absorb noises as well. I'm going to put that on. That minimized it, didn't eliminate it. I'm just going to pinch it. And that really helped get rid of the noise. So that's the purpose of this tool. That's why the spring's here, but it's not enough on this rotor. Okay, and you can see how we are resurfacing. I'm going to stop for a bit and I'll re... For the sake of time, I'll resurface it as we later outside of filming. I just want to make sure of what you understand one more principle. Notice my sleeves are rolled up. I'm working around revolving work. And we get into sanding, I'm going to actually sand and help knock off some of the rough cuts. This, this cutter is cutting, it's tearing. It's actually more of a tear and it leaves lots of rough edges and so we're going to sand them off and we'll get to that later. But again, notice my sleeves are rolled up because I don't want to have any risk of something being pulled into the revolving work because it will hurt you in a very, very bad way. So please, don't, don't work around this with your coveralls or a long sleeve shirt. Roll them up out of the way. Okay, now, we've mostly resurfaced. I haven't got all the way yet. We're going to do that last little bit here with video. I want to touch on a few things about vibrations. Of course, this has been a great piece to help me minimize vibrations. Of course, this has been great to help us, again, minimize vibrations that, or that squealing, that high-pitched noise we heard earlier. That's your sign for vibration. These are tight. These are tight. I want to share one more thing about vibrations. Really, the whole gold resurface a rotor is to take just enough off to do the trick. Just barely enough off to make a nice flat surface. In fact, I'm going to bump the machine a little bit here, and you're going to see an area that, I hope the camera can get this, right here, there's this little region that didn't get quite all cleaned up. 
Over here it's pretty clean, over there it's pretty clean, but right here it's not quite as clean. I'll try different angles of light here, see if that helps. As long as the rotor is about 95% resurfaced, you're fine. We're going to sand it, it's flat. Maybe I could have went a little deeper, yes. But my point is, if you go too deep, you're going to do, one, you're going to do two things. One, you're going to enhance the chance for a high pitch vibration. You'll, you'll find that on experience one day. Deep cuts make for vibrations. You can't get away from it. Second of all, if I take off too much material, I'm actually taking away material that will help absorb heat from the braking action. The heat that happens between this pad and that rotor surface develops obviously extreme amounts of heat, a lot of you know kinetic energy and, and energy given off in the form of heat. Well, we need all the material we can have to help absorb and dissipate heat. The thinner the rotor, the less dissipation, which equates and translates into more of a warped rotor. So, in actuality, a new rotor is probably best to do in most applications. But sometimes, being able to resurface a rotor, we can't maybe get a hold of the, of the correct rotor, or maybe the rotor is plenty thick enough to begin with to get it back in service. In fact, let's talk about thickness right now. Um, I'll just go ahead and use this digital caliper. I'm going to zero it out. There we go. And I can, of course, be in millimeters or inches. I'm an inch guy. <laughs> and let's just see how thick this rotor is. I'm not even sure what vehicle this came off of, but uh, we'll do a few uh, examples. We'll just do an example here. So this rotor is measuring 0.957. It's almost an inch thick. It's 975 thousandths thick. Now maybe the minimum thickness for this car is, let's say, 960. And so 960 and 975, you subtract those, that leaves you about, what, 15 thousandths? Man, I would want at least 15 thousandths left for wear to wear down to uh, the minimum thickness. So I'm going to say 15 or 20 thousandths I would like to have uh, for, for wear uh, above the minimum specification that you would look up for a vehicle. Yes, the brake pad does take most of the wear, but the rotors, they get worn too, okay? They, they experience some wear. Okay, let's finish off our machining. I'm just going to turn it back on, and it doesn't matter if you turn the machine on or off during your machining process, it's okay. Yeah, we're doing good. We're going to finish this off, and then we're going to Re, uh, sand it and the emery cloth okay this wet dry emery cloth does this one have the number on it yes it does somewhere around 120 grit whoops or 150 grit is ideal grit the roughness the coarseness of the paper to sand now General Motors Toyota Honda Cadillac, all the companies I've ever read about resurfacing rotors years ago always said spend at least a minute or 60 seconds per side. And we're going to swirl it as we go or just kind of go back and forth to leave what's called a non-directional finish. If you think about it, this cutter has been moving out slowly. I think this road takes about four, for every revolution, the cutter moves like four thousandths of an inch. It's actually kind of like this long spiral, kind of a groove. I wouldn't take this off. And it looks like, okay, back up a moment, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna disengage and crank this out of my way now. Get it back out of the way a ways. And again, I'm going to be up here working around a revolving piece. My sleeves are rolled up. I got my 150 grit emery cloth. And here goes my sanding. Yeah, we probably could have took a little more off this side. It's okay. It'd be a good example for you to see. This other side looks better. But again, my, my concern is, is that uh, we leave as much as possible for good heat dissipation. 
I'll move the paper around. Some guys even like to use a body uh, sanding block. If you want to put your emery cloth on a body sanding block, that works good too. I'll just do it by hand. And I'm not keeping track of time here for the sake of the movie, but you get the idea. We're going to sand, knock off again all those rough uh, cutting filings and, and edges from the cutter bit. Again, it tears. It actually tears. It doesn't cut. We'll do both sides. Some guys like to swirl. Some guys just kind of go back and forth. Some guys move slowly. Again, the whole idea is a non-directional finish. This was Toyota tried to help me understand years ago when I was a young tech technician. All right. Okay. Again. After we spend about a minute on each side, we're going to take this off and we're going to wash it. Let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to go ahead and take off this wonderful machine rotor. <laughs> Please hang these up in an organized fashion. I don't like them laying everywhere in the, in the Bits, or the, I should say the uh, filings. Okay, take this off. One of these hooks on hooks better than the other. Designs that come apart on one of these. There it is. Gotta find the right combination. Okay. Now, here's the next little step in the process. I just get an old five gallon bucket, cut it in half with a hacksaw, we get hot water, salt, hot soapy water, and we're going to fill this up. And I'll tell you why the reason for hot soapy water. Water demagnetizes and helps lift the filings off. I'm sorry, demagnetizes so the filings can come off, where the soap does the lifting. So again, the water demagnetizes and the soap lifts. And you don't have to get too fussy here. That's probably good enough. I just get a nice brush. And we, all we're trying to do is can clean the rotor. Both sides. don't want to do is not forget to wash it. Some folks will just take brake, brake spray after it's been machined and they'll just hose it off. Well that doesn't get the filings off. It gets some but not many. This will get them all off. And that's ready to put on the vehicle. If you want to get a purple towel and tap, pat it dry a little bit more you could. But not a big deal, it's cast iron. It's gonna rust quite readily. Okay, so we've talked about rotor, brake blades, and setup. I wanna do one more setup here. Because many of you probably don't have a rapid adapter uh, in your line of tools. So I'm gonna take this off for two reasons. We're gonna cut a drum, we're also gonna talk about the other adapters actually come with this AccuTurn brake blade. And many brake blades are much the same uh, pattern after this one. Put those up there for now. So this is the part and solo we just did. We're going to set him aside. What you normally get with your lathe is going to be some different adapters. And we need to find out which diameter, you get two of these, you get two of these, and you get two of a, of a third larger one, which one is going to fit inside this rotor the best? Well, this is plenty small, 
I'm going the next size up. That still fits in here and it stays on the flat machined surface of the rotor. Again, I don't want to, I don't want to be clamping up here. We down here on the flat, the actual hub region. This one works. I'll be fine. I wouldn't want any tighter fit than that. So I'll put the adapter on. Now, in this case, we're going to put a spring on first. Now the spring always goes with the cone. Is this the right cone? I haven't even tried it yet. Looks like it, it will be, it'll work. The cone fits in there. So again, spring, cone, it's kind of the reverse of the last setup. But this cup here, or this adapter, is going to push the rotor up on the cone. That's the whole idea. And the reason I want to use this adapter is it's a direct matchup with the other one. Less chance for vibration. If I was to use a smaller one, yeah, it's going to work. But I might, have, I might expose myself to a vibration issue. Let's go back on. Spring, cone, this adapter. Now, a little bit difference here. We're going to put some spacers. Again, I got my left-handed nut for the arbor shaft. That's the big shaft underneath everything, the arbor. after. <laughs> I probably should have. I don't like much thread hanging out. I don't, know, I don't know if I bottomed out, but anyway. And much the same as that other nut we tightened. I just put my wrench on here and give it a good pop or two. That should be good and firm. And once again, I would turn this lead screw to bring these cutters in line. So we're way out of line now. Okay, that's what I would do. All right, we won't resurface this rotor. I just wanted to show that option for setup. Choose the right adapters that fit the hub. Put the cone and the spring on the inside. This one. Let's cut a drum. Okay, let's turn a drum. I know drums are almost becoming a thing of the past, but they're not quite out of it. There's still a few cars made with drum brakes. They're just too economical to make or manufacture to keep the price of the vehicle down. And of course, we all drive old vehicles. <laughs> now, much the same setup. Um, you already know what these wrenches are for. In fact, that won't even be used with this setup. But we've got to put on a boring bar a drum. Now, we've got these different adapters. Now, this adapter, yes, would work, but what would be best, this big flat area, I can get away with a bigger adapter. That's going to grip it at a bigger contact uh, position, again, to help minimize vibration. And of course, I'm going to have the opposing adapter the same size on both sides of this setup. So here we go. Let's put this adapter onto the arbor, like we always do, cone, as usual, and uh, as far as which, or the spring, sorry, as far as which cone, well, this one here won't really fit, so I've got to get another one that almost falls through, but it'll be okay. We've got to choose the lesser of two evils. Alrighty. Oh, I better change this. We better stop. Well, keep going. Keep the film rolling. We're going to take, we're going to stop what we're doing <laughs> and switch off this uh, cutter attachment for rotors and set it aside. We're going to put on the boring bar. I guess I should use the brush. That's what's preferred, actually. Don't use compressed air around these. Uh, ways and machines. It pushes sharp little uh, filings up inside all thing everywhere and 
That thing that jams things up. Okay, so here's a boring bar. Um, put the nut on. Now I'm not sure just how far in or out to put this yet. Okay, let's get the drum on, then we're gonna decide how to do this one. I will need to crank this in, I can tell you that. Crank this in a ways. All right, let's put this drum on. We've got a cone, got our adapter, spring, and I'm just gonna make sure he's not interfering with anything that we're doing yet. Okay, find that cone, there we go. Just pushes it up on the cone, and left-handed nut. Okay, and again the wrench, just give it a pop or two, not to get too excited on that. Now the anti-vibration, we actually have a vibration dampener for this, and I've got my own approach. <laughs> this is for really wide, wide rotors, but actually um, to help absorb out here better, I'm actually finding that if I hook up this wide one with the lead lugs, I'm going to stretch this on a little better than that. Mm. Stay on there. There we go. The real drum, uh, the, the vibration strap for the, the, the true one for the drums is this one here. It's got a buckle on one end. We'll get to the buckle last. I'm actually going to kind of favor out here on the end. Because vibrations occur out here more than they do here in the, in, on the inside. Out here on the edge is where vibrations tend to occur. So, I'm going to strap this around. And this, all you've got to do is just kind of open it up and hook it like that. You don't, you don't have to find a hole. That's, that's good enough. All right, we're on clear around. Now we gotta set this up. Let's manipulate some things to get the boring bar set up so it's pretty parallel, for the most part parallel, with how I'm gonna cut. And if it's too deep, go ahead and back up a little. If the boring bar is too deep, of course, this is the lead screw we're gonna self-engage later. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna set the boring bar, it's about two-thirds or three-fourths of the way in. I'm going to go about halfway in, make a scratch cut again, right? First of all, I want to make sure I'm in far enough, and I am. I'm going to, I'm going to tilt the boring bar just slightly. I want to make sure it clears, okay. Of course, this has got to be tight. If things aren't tight, that's a lot of leverage out here to try to keep from vibrating. Drums are inherent to vibrate worse. Okay, we're tight. We're going to turn the machine on, make a scratch cut. This is the uh, lead screw I'll be turning to make the scratch cut. But this is the lead screw that's going to self-feed and resurface the drum. Okay, I'll switch it to drum. And, okay, go ahead and focus right in here, if you can. I'm going to take it out. I'm going to take this guy out just until we barely touch. Nice light. Watch what I do now. Go ahead, you're fine there. I'm going to bring this all out, on out, because on the very edge, this very rusty edge, is where the shoes, the brake shoes, don't seem to ride, and it often leaves a lip and that lip can just be rust and corrosion, or it can actually be cast iron because it's worn from this side inward. So I'm just gonna hand machine this one. So I'm gonna turn the horizontal lead screw and kind of go slow. Make sure there's not gonna be a big lip at the end of my cut. I'm gonna turn right around and go back in. 
at scratch cut depth. Now here's the tricky part. How far in to go? I want to go in. Right into the corner, best I can. Hope that's not too much light. I might take it just a little bit too far. I'm going wider. I think I'm actually in there now. Almost to where the shoes were riding. I gotta go just a little bit more. Little bit more. Turning it back on. I think we're there. Okay, now. Let's focus our attention over the lead screw. I've got to look at these numbers. Now I can't zero out these numbers, but right here it looks like I'm sitting on about 66 thousandths. I know, I know that's not much of an indicator, but that's our indicator. And then there's a 65 and one more line, about 66 thousandths. I'm going to go at least 10 thousandths. Drums are just hard to resurface because they're always out around. And the lathe isn't perfect either. Never, they never are. I'm going to crank it out to, well, there's 76, there's even 80. So I went, obviously, more than 10 thousandths. I went close to 14 thousandths. But I don't want to engage this one. <laughs> that would be a bad mistake. That would bring the cutter out and jam and stop the machine. I'm going to self-feed horizontally. That's why I select the drum. That's why I'm going to select feed on this. So let's just see. Make a consistent cut. It's not skipping. That's good news. Let's let it cut here for a while. If I didn't go deep enough, it's going to have a skipping sound. And I've always had to go at least 10,000 steep to avoid the skipping sound. Now it's going deeper and lighter, deeper and lighter. That's just because of the outer roundness of the drum and the imperfections of the lathe, how things are set up. It's never perfect. I almost want to be out around. Or, uh, we're doing good. Okay, now. We're not through resurfacing, obviously. I just want to point out a few things, if we can see it. We've resurfaced out to this point. From this point out, of course, it's still shiny and, and uh, needs to be resurfaced. Um, actually, shiny is a better type of surface, but sometimes we're trying to get rid of you know, irregularities. This drum's actually in really good shape. Probably didn't need resurfacing, but it was a good candidate to resurface nonetheless. Um, we're still able to have a consistent cut. As I turn it on, we'll hear that consistent noise. And we're gonna sand. And this thing's revolving, we're gonna sand it just like we would a, drum, or a rotor. We're again for a good minute. And we'll take it over to the sink. We'll give it a soapy bubble bath. I'm gonna go ahead and continue on with my cut. Good. Okay. So again, we're going to use 150 grit, just like we did rotors. The cast iron drum, just like the rotors are cast iron. Almost there. If we had a big heavy lip at the end, it, it might. I don't know, it just might make for a more of a vibrating, chattering type of end. I'd like to knock that lip off of the start as I showed you earlier. Okay, now let's just go ahead and lead screw for a bit. And so again, I'm going to disengage. I'm going to crank out the cutter. Clear away from... I don't want to get my arm wrapped up around that cutter. Okay, once again, I'm going to sand away. Just leave the machine running. Feels nice and smooth as it is. Our goal is to make a smooth finish. This gives us better contact with our friction materials of a brake shoe. 
on the disc brake world, brake pad, the smoother, shinier finishes are actually more desirable than a rough cut finish that's not been, you know, sanded down and finished. Get better braking. Okay. I'm going to use that for about a minute. I mean, I've got a minute, but it's again, it's okay. I'm going to uh, take this off. Bring the wrench up. Take my adapter off. I'm going to peel off my uh, silencer bands. Now, we would normally, once again, we'd go ahead and take this over the, to the sink and hit it with hot, soapy water. Again, the water demagnetizes where the soap lifts and gets all the debris. Because really, again, let's come over here. The real fear is why we clean them up so good is that, once again, the new brake lining, if I was to put this in service right now without washing it, the new lining, the new shoe, the new the friction linings, they would apply the brake the first time you hit the brakes on this vehicle and all these filings would end up inside the uh, friction material. I know this is a pad, not a drum, but the, 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 the uh, filings would embed into here. Well, now it's going to squeak and it's going to squeak for the rest of the pad's life. So, wash them. Don't be afraid to wash them. Some of the old timers in the shop aren't going to understand why. It's just part of life. Oh, let's talk about brake me drum measurement for a little bit and then we'll end. Now, quite often, on a drum, it's got listed the max diameter. And I don't know if that's quite legible. It says max DIA. 9.59 so this is a nine and a half inch drum designed to let 90 thousandths you know be machined off or wear out to that that's the maximum diameter this probably came from the factory close to 9.500 in a nominal or I guess a, a standard thickness but uh, okay okay so we got a drum we looked at what was stamped on it for the maximum diameter and um, here is a nice <laughs> we don't get to see these very often but we we kind of decided to buy a digital drum micrometer can you see the whole thing this thing goes pretty big I guess the battery's low that's why it's blinking <laughs> but these jaws are going to measure the drum just for fun I guess I should zero out, which I already did. Let's just see how big this drum actually is. Not many shops are willing to step up and buy these, but we're teaching classes here. So this is measuring 9.570. I've got 20 thousandths more. Uh, this is 20 thousandths under size, which is great. So I'm not out to the maximum spec, am I? If I move this around a little, so, maybe not quite, more closer to uh, 23, but I'm, I'm under spec. That's always a good thing. That means I got more material right here to absorb heat. As this drum wears, of course, it's going to get bigger. Okay, so we talked about the drum earlier. And stamped on the side of the drum, it had that max diameter again of 9.59. I'm going to add a zero because we always talk in thousands. Tenths of an inch, hundredths of an inch, one thousandths of an inch. And often this max diameter is listed in, in millimeters. This one just has to have to be listed in inches. So, anyway, let's talk about 9.590, a little closer. Again, this is the maximum the drum can wear out to. We measured 9.5, I believe, 7.7 at the end. 
Well, that's a smaller diameter than the maximum, so we are in good shape. This drum could be put back into service no problem. In fact, that's what, 13 thousandths undersized? Is my math right? <laughs> we'll have to make sure. Okay. We like to leave roughly 15, okay, this is approximate, 15 thousandths of an inch. Make that better. Whoops. It's nice to leave approximately 15 thousandths of an inch for wear after we've machined. And that's what we were able to accomplish with this drum. Okay, so let's conclude. Today, we, of course, learned how to use a bench, brake lathe, where we learned how to resurface or machine rotors and drums. Of course, obviously, another name for a drum, or I'm sorry, a disc, brake, rotor is the disc itself. And of course, we did the drum, it turned out quite nicely. But we tried to highlight vibrations and how to minimize vibrations while the work is revolving or being re machined. There's uh, this little rubbing block that rubs against the uh, rotor while we machine and of course a silencer band. There's different styles. We showed the spring style. Here's also this rubber band with the lead lugs style. But uh, we hope this will be a, a valuable tool in helping you uh, resurface discs and drums when it is uh, an option. Uh, more successfully and uh, wish you well in your pursuit of studying uh, the automotive industry. Thank you.